Our next speaker is Erica Gertze. She's an associate professor in the Department of Oceanography. She has a bachelor's degree in biology from Wesleyan and a PhD from Scripps. Her talk is entitled Environmental DNA Biotic Surveys at the Deep Sea Floor, Biodiversity, Biogeography, and Biomonitoring. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Doug, for the invitation to participate in this symposium. I'm glad to be here. Um, and I'm also glad I'm coming after Peter and Rob because you've covered some of the methods topics that I actually am not going to talk about. So now you have all been exposed to some of those issues. Um, so I'm going to continue on talking about eDNA, but I'm going to now move into a very different habitat and go down to the deep sea floor. Uh, and so the context for this work is that there's been increasing, recent increasing commercial interest in polymetallic nodule mining in the deep sea floor. And so what we're talking about are these nodules in the bottom right. These are um, otherwise called manganese nodules that are also rich in copper and nickel uh, that are commercially important. Um, and it turns out that a region of the ocean that has the highest densities or abundances of these nodules is fairly close to Hawaii. This region called the clarion Clipperton zone that's to the southeast of us. Uh, over here, here's Hawaii, Baja, right? So this whole region is commercially relevant. Uh, and so there are now, the ISA has granted 16 exploration contract um, claim areas here. Uh, and so they're under development now for commercial mining. And so uh, this aerial extent, just to give you some sense, it's on the order of 80% of the contiguous United States. So it's a really large um, spatial area. And so this anthropogenic impact, mining impact, is likely to play out in an ecosystem about which we have relatively little baseline ecological information. So in general, abyssal habitats are not well sampled. They're remote. They're difficult to sample. So uh, abyssal habitats are largely unexplored on the order of less than 0.01% have been sampled in terms of their aerial extent. And many, many species are undescribed. So reports are often in the range of 80% or higher of macrofaunal and myofaunal invertebrates are undescribed. So we don't know a lot about these systems. Uh, abyssal plains also are typically quite quiescent, physically quiescent environments. So they don't experience a lot of um, high current velocity. So these organisms that inhabit these areas are not adapted to this um, high distur disturbance that we would expect with mining. Um, also, the communities tend to have high local diversity. Um, and the majority of species are rare. So it's common to be rare, which makes it challenging to complete sort of comprehensive biotic surveys in these systems. Um, and then lastly, we know there's a unique uh, nodule community. So lots of taxa from microbes up to megafaunal invertebrates live in association with the nodules themselves. And so removal of nodules is uh, hugely detrimental to this component of the community. So collectively, we expect to see um, large-scale impacts on this system about which we have relatively little information, and we think uh, many of these taxa are going to be sensitive to this disturbance. So our pr this work that I'm going to talk about in the Deep Seas program, this is a larger effort, multi-PI effort, uh, on which this, the sort of linchpin coordinator is Craig Smith in the Oceanography Department, and Jeff Drazen and I are both involved here at UH. Uh, and so it's one sort of overarching goal is to conduct baseline surveys looking at species, composi species composition of these communities, abundance, biomass, and ecosystem function across the CCZ. Um, and so for the eDNA survey in particular that, that uh, I'm talking about, the primary goals are to conduct baseline surveys of invertebrate and vertebrate metazoans. So that's the organismal target. Um, this is a community metabarcoding assessment, so I'm interested in diversity uh, and community composition. And then to assess seawater sediment and polymetallic nodules as source material for eDNA surveys. So evaluate, if you think about this in sort of a biomonitoring um, assessment effort, what type of samples are required to capture the full community. And then lastly, evaluate or test whether seamounts are biodiversity hotspots uh, that could serve as refugia for mining and be important sources for larvae that could recolonize, again, the seafloor following disturbance. So those were some of our, our core goals. Uh, we had funding to go out on the Kilo Moana and sample in the Western CCZ in May and June of 2018. So we were able to sample in these uh, APEIs. So I didn't mention these are um, areas of particular environmental interest, our set aside no mining um, reserve areas. And so one primary goal of the deep seas effort was to um, characterize and sample in these reserve zones and understand whether they're representative of the broader community that's targeted for mining. So we were sampling in API 7, uh, 4, and 1. And within each of these areas, we have material from seamount summits uh, and then also adjacent abyssal plains regions to look at this bathymetric comparison. So in terms of the eDNA um, effort and our overall approach, we were using standard CTD, um, CAS, and Niskin 
uh, bottle and rosette sampling to collect seawater from the sea surface down to five meters above bottom and filtering a range of volumes from one meter replicates in the upper ocean down to five liter replicates at, at the deep sea floor onto 0.2 micron filters, and then collecting um, sediment cores and polymetallic nodules using um, UH's ROV, new ROV Lu'ukai. This was its first um, larger scale expedition. Uh, and in terms of the molecular approach, uh, I'm glad that Peter and Rob came before me because I'm not going to spend much time on this at all. This is an Amplicon community sequencing effort. So again, we're, our target is looking at community diversity, capturing the organisms that are inhabiting these regions. We are initially starting with two markers, so the 18S V4 region and the cytochrome oxidase subunit 1 common marker that's normally used for DNA barcoding of metazoans. And in terms of bioinformatics, um, this work has been uh, processed using CHIME-2 with chimera detection and removal in data 2. Okay, so in terms of what we find, so one of the key strengths of eDNA that's been mentioned um, by our prior speakers is that it covers a very wide range of taxa, and so that's true here. Uh, pretty fascinating, the diversity of organisms that are contained in these samples also across body size. So we go from very small things like nematodes dominate in the sediment samples up to, we were talking earlier about beaked whales and marine mammals are also represented in this data set. So it's a very wide diversity covering 19 phyla, 35 classes, 71 orders, and 97 families of animals. Okay, and this is including only the abyssal metazoans, so we've sequenced the diversity in the upper water column and actually removed the pelagic taxa. Okay, so also just to give you a sense of um, how these samples are distinct or where the diversity lies in these abyssal systems, turns out the sediments are really diverse. Um, you know, you can see in both the 18S data, the CO1 data, um, the sediments have high diversity in comparison to the nodules and benthic boundary layer seawater samples as a function of uh, the amount we've, of material we've processed. So 20 grams of sediment, um, five grams of nodules, and 10 liters of, of seawater near the seafloor. Okay, and so in general, just a comment that the sediment samples tend to track the myofaunal community um, with dominance by nematodes, uh, shown in red, and arthropods, herpactigoid, copepods are known subdominance for the myofaunal size fraction. So that's predominantly what the sediments capture, but it's um, a range of other things. And then you'll note in white in CO1, one of the challenges that Rob also mentioned, we have lots of um, unassigned uh, taxa. And this is actually new for me. I got into this because I've been working on metabarcoding studies on uh, zooplankton samples, both in the abyssal ocean, the demersal, three meters above bottom uh, material, as well as in the upper ocean. And we have much higher um, proportions of the community. Actually, virtually all of it is classified in the upper ocean. So this is uh, unique for me to this kind of eDNA samples. I think it's partly because we're in the deep sea and we have uh, you know, we lack reference sequences, as Rob described, but I think it's also that nobody cares about worms, as he mentioned, and so, you know, these are all nematodes. We have, obviously, no nematodes classified at CO1, so we really lack particular taxa that are not sexy, don't have uh, large reference databases. Okay, and so one first question, as I mentioned, was looking at, you know, what fidelity does eDNA tools, do, do they have to capturing these uh, communities that are distinct across different substrate types? And so it turns out that there is um, fairly high fidelity. These, it captures very distinct communities across sediments, nodules, and seawater. And so this graphland plot is just um, illustrating uh, how reeds are distributed for some of the most common dominant ASVs in our material. Uh, where color, these different circles on the outside is showing you the distribution of reeds across phyla for the common taxa. And then uh, seawater, this, these are an estimate of relative reed abundance in blue in seawater on the outside, sediment in the middle ring, and then polymetallic nodules in red on the inside. So you can sort of visually sense that there's quite a lot of taxa that are associated to a particular substrate type. And so if you look at what types of organisms are exclusively found on nodules, uh, this tracks the prior literature that we have lots of sessile suspension feeders, um, things like corals, um, Alcyonacean corals, bryzoans, um, some ascidians, brachiopods, a variety of sponges, um, bivalves, some polychaetes, et cetera. This is a partial list, but just to give you a sense that there are, we do capture a range of nodule associated groups only on nodules. And then in terms of sediments, uh, this is overwhelmingly, as I mentioned, the nematodes. We have lots of diversity. 62% of the ASVs are in the nematodes, um, which is what we would expect based on prior work, with subdominance by herpactocoids and then a range of other soft-bodied um, flatworms, xenocelomorpha, groups that are difficult um, to sample or identify using conventional means. 
Uh, and then in terms of seawater, uh, there are also a range of cnidarians that are sampled only in the benthic boundary layer, but interestingly also some of the mobile epifauna, things in the echinoderms, are sampled um, primarily or exclusively in the benthic boundary layer material. Okay, so another look at just separating in terms of how communities parse out as a function of geographic region and substrate type, and it's uh, illustrating that substrate is actually one of the primary characteristics that separates community diversity, where um, color again tracks substrate. But S now, uh, these samples are collected on seamount summits, uh, and the ones without a letter are on abyssal plains. So just you can also see some separation as a function of bathymetric habitat, which I'll come back to. And also it illustrates sort of greater resolution, right? These markers have different strengths, where 18S is more conserved, and so is covering probably closer to family level taxonomic resolution, and CO1 is closer to um, putative species level, where we're clustering at 97% similarity. Uh, and then lastly, looking at sort of overlap in these communities, um, a bit, you know, as I mentioned, keeping in mind if you're going to use this as a biomonitoring tool, what types of samples are required to do that effectively. Uh, it turns out in terms of overlap that you have uh, really low levels of overlap, really low levels of overlap between different substrate types where it's 5% or less uh, of the total diversity is shared between these different substrates. So they're really very distinct samples, and in some sense that's um, that's a good thing. It means eDNA has high fidelity to capture the distinct communities that we know exist in these um, habitat types. So then moving on to think a bit about abyssal seamounts. This was a particular focus for the NOAA OE grant that Jeff Drazen was a lead PI on. And so uh, in our material looking at the impor potential importance of seamounts as refugia, we do find um, High, some evidence for higher richness, ASV richness and OTU richness for CO1 at seamount summit sites in comparison to the abyssal plains at equivalent sampling coverage. Um, so that's interesting and important also for broader sort of ecological questions. We also find evidence for distinct community composition on the seamounts where there's a significant effect of bathymetric habitat observed both in sediments and in seawater with a consistent shift across the two APEIs in terms of uh, relative dominance of nematodes are more important on abyssal plains and a shift towards um, flatworms and arthropods on the seamount summit sites. And then we also find um, a last pattern looking at biogeography in comparison between the seamount summits and the abyssal plain sites where within the scope, geographic scope of our material, we can categorize uh, organisms as a function of how widespread they are and whether they're restricted to particular bathymetric habitat types. So in green are things that are um, unique to a particular APEI and bathymetric habitat, either on seamount summits or abyssal plains. So these are either endemic or what Craig would call pseudo-endemic. So we have lots of things that are rare, so that's what you need, why you see such a large fraction is green. Um, things that are purple, organisms that are purple are cosmopolitan, so they're widespread across APEIs and also sampled in both seamounts and abyssal plains. And then in orange, uh, you have taxa that are bathymetrically restricted, so they occur either only in plains or in seamounts, but occur across APEIs, so they're widespread but bathymetrically restricted. And so the difference here is if you compare seamounts versus plains that a smaller proportion of the community essentially is seamount associated but occurs across multiple seamounts uh, in comparison to abyssal plains. So there's a shift in terms of the, the community structure in terms of the relative biogeographic um, patterns of the taxa that are present. Um, and then lastly, here is a point we were um, also looking at sort of initial, right, one of our initial goals, right, was to try to evaluate whether seamount populations could be larval sources to the abyssal plain uh, and so looking at the metabarcoding data uh, for any evidence, initial evidence of population genetic structure within species. So if you look at the cosmopolitan taxa in purple and evaluate what fraction of those organisms appear to have CO1 haplotypes that are restricted in distribution to either seamount summits or abyssal plains, you find that 26% of taxa have some kind of geographic shift in terms of the haplotypes present. So that's um, potentially interesting in terms of um, sort of a straw man initial hypothesis of whether there's a prevalent population genetic structure within species. So um, with that, that's actually moving to my conclusion slides and some management implications. So just to summarize some of what we learned in terms of eDNA metabarcoding methods, this is 
these tools are effective at capturing these distinct, distinct communities that are known to occur in association with these different abyssal substrates. Uh, the methods have high power to detect rare components of the fauna, as well as lots of small, soft-bodied things that are commonly missed. We have lots of worms. And then uh, it yields baseline measures of community diversity that are not reliant on complete taxonomic knowledge. And that's particularly important in the deep sea, where we have a huge fraction of the communities undescribed. So, and in particularly in the context of mining, where we have a sequence as some kind of objective record of what organism was there in advance of mining, even if we can't classify it. In 10 years, we may be able to with advances in the reference databases, and that's still an incredibly valuable observation. So in terms of the management implications, we encourage, you know, we're recommending adoption as one component uh, of a standard survey technique that it would be valuable for, you know, surveying biodiversity and biogeography. It is not at the moment adapted as a standard measurement tool for the ISA uh, contractor community. And then uh, I've shown some evidence for deep seamounts as biodiversity hotspots with distinct community composition and biogeography in comparison to the abyssal plains. And what that means in terms of the mining context, or one implication, is that although it's important to conserve these distinct seamount communities, given relatively low faunal overlap, we see uh, only about 16 to 19 percent of CO1 OTUs are shared between seamounts and abyssal plains, that preservation of seamount communities is, would be insufficient to conserve the dominant reproductive populations of abyssal plains fauna. So, um, they're important, but insufficient. And then lastly, there are lots of methodological aspects that I'm so glad that Rob and Peter talked about um, that I have swept under the rug. We've done some work on this. Actually, we do have a manuscript in review looking at some aspects that we could address within the scope of our study. So one question was looking at alloxinous DNA that's raining in from the upper ocean. What, how, what fraction of the diversity is that at the sea floor? We've looked also a bit at um, sediment transport and the potential importance of winnowing and the time scales over which eDNA may uh, synthesize observations uh, in abyssal, abyssal seamounts versus planes. And so I'll just refer you to manuscript in, in review on that. So with that, I thank my, in particular, my co-authors, Craig, uh, Ollie, and Oliver Kirsten, and my funding sources, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, so let me just repeat the question. So the question is about that all the eDNA data sets, or it's come up in several of the talks, that we have a low proportion of the community that's classified at particular markers. Um, and so what is the vision for expanding reference databases into the future that would help us classify? And so that's an incredibly important question. And actually, one of the things I try to make sure I do in each of these papers is clearly state the value of the tax, you know, DNA taxonomy and the people who are doing the work that create these reference databases, because it's undervalued in the community. And we are losing that expertise. And that's a huge problem. So. You know, I'm trying to get the message out over and over that you know, the power of eDNA tools relies on all of that prior systematic knowledge and that it's attached to a DNA sequence. So you know, we need people in museums and other places who are doing that work and who are putting names on sequences, even for unsexy groups like nematodes. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a challenge, a broad challenge for our community, yeah, and making sure that work gets done. So. Okay, let's thank Erica once more.